when my husband and I started in farming, it was basically just for the men. Women tagged along and maybe listened, but I feel the trend is for the uh, young, women, young wives to get involved with their husbands. I think this is a good trend. When I first started the company, the, um, most of my family was very, was, were fairly indulgent about it. They kind of patted me on the head and thought it was okay to be doing this, but they didn't take it seriously at all. I went back to school. I hated it, but I went. I took the nurse's aid training. I didn't like that, but I did. I had to prove that I could do something on my own. Me do, you know. I'm a risk taker. When I look, um, I like planning my day, planning my week, my month, setting goals. And uh, it's like the hurdler. You keep your eyes on the finish line, not each hurdle that you must encounter. The changes that women have made for themselves and the recognition that about those changes in society is the major change in, in, of this century. You know, you do what you have to do, and that's the most important thing there is. There isn't even time to stop and think about it. You simply do it. We were a large family, so of course the instinct to survive was inbred. Oh, we did without a lot of things, but the basic essentials were always there. I found some way to do it. I did. I took a part-time job so I could take care of my kids when they came home from school. I found ways of making do with less, of stretching, using bits and pieces to improvise, to create. I even taught my kids to wear their hand-me-downs with pride. But the main thing was we were making. There wasn't anything we couldn't do. Of course my kids were going to go to college. You know, you never think of it as any great contribution. At least it never seemed that way to me. It was just simply my job. Our lives and work today, the values we hold, and the conflicts we face are all rooted in our history. We've been told how Virginia men have shaped the nation. Can't we also hear echoes from the past of women's accomplishments and values in our lives? When the English came to what was for them a new world in 1607, they entered a confederation of over 40 Indian tribes. Pocahontas, perhaps the most famous woman in Virginia's history, was said to have thrown herself over John Smith's body to save him from execution. Though still presented in some books today, the legend of Pocahontas was most likely the creation of John Smith's imagination. Then what facts do we know about the Indian women? We know that in their society, unlike European cultures, Political power passed through mothers instead of fathers. We know the women raised corn, the Indians' most important product, and enabled the English to survive by teaching them how to plant it. It was the queen of the Appomattox who supplied the starving English with corn to eat. By 1611, however, alarmed as the English began carving out plantations on her territory, she attacked the colonists and in the battle, lost her life. The English survived. They had come to explore the land and seek their fortunes. They found a harsh and relentless environment. Their first settlements were no more than temporary outposts without foundations. Of the women, 80% were indentured servants who signed on for five to seven years of labor for passage to what they hoped would be a better world. They were not free to marry. It was their job to keep the colony fed and alive. Every two years, a woman was pregnant. It was her duty to provide her family with as many children as possible to help with the work. Only half of her children ever reached adulthood. These women led lives that were exhausting and usually short, yet their contributions and the stability which they brought
proved to be the foundation upon which society grew. We've chosen our priorities in life. We have chosen family and home above anything. This is, of course, I guess my ultimate goal, is that they will become four productive individuals in society, that they will do something useful with their life. And I'm not saying that the boy needs to be a farmer and, you know, that one needs to be a teacher, and, you know, but even if they just maintain a happy, stable marriage and raise children, I mean, to me, that's a success. I think the farm wife is more fortunate than many other women because uh, we are working at home many times with our husbands and therefore uh, we have a very direct teaching responsibility with our children we're with them so much to me it, it forms a more stable family unit to be with your children to watch them grow and develop and to be able to be there for them when they need you um, perhaps this was the greatest influence on me in giving up my career as teaching was, um, to me, it had become very obvious in the classroom that um, many children were without their mothers uh, simply because women were out seeking a career rather than seeking to be a good mother, a good homemaker. This is not to criticize a person who seeks a career because I think for financial reasons, many couples do both have to work to support a family. But if it's not necessary, I think you can make a much greater contribution by being in the home. And you, you take the federal withholding and... In talking about the advantages um, that her children had when they were growing up in comparison to what our children have, I think a lot of this can be attributed to just how society has changed through the years. Um, it, it's just sort of an ongoing thing, you know. It, it, it didn't just stop for them and start for us. I mean, it's just each generation seems to want to do better for their children. As the colony took hold and settlements spread, the roles of women came to be more recognized. Even the House of Burgesses noticed that. In the new plantation, it is not known whether a man or a woman be the most necessary. Indeed, the almost desperate need for women put them in a position to challenge traditional English attitudes about patriarchal authority and control over property. Sarah Harrison Blair realized the bargaining power of pioneering women when she married in 1687. At her marriage ceremony, she refused no, to take the vow of obedience. And do you promise to obey your husband? No, obey. Do you? The persistent minister eventually gave up. Nevertheless, custom prevented women from becoming educated and holding office of church or state. Moreover, by a law of 1699, Virginia became the only colony to explicitly prevent women from voting. No matter how well women performed during this period, their achievements did nothing to change the prevailing belief in the natural inferiority of women. With tobacco, Tidewater planters realized their fortunes. On the horizons, their mansions grew. The wealthiest planters built imposing homes of brick, such as this mansion at Shirley Plantation. The planters' wives found that as life became more stable, their duties became more complex. While they were the delicate, refined hostesses of their husbands' estates, they were also managers of large households of families and servants. They worked gardens, sewed clothes, supervised hog killings, and nursed the sick. Relying heavily on labor, the wealthy planters could most afford to support the new institution of slavery. For every new indentured servant imported from England, four black slaves arrived from Africa or the Caribbean. Men and women alike were forced into hard labor in the fields. From 1662 to 1705, the General Assembly passed a series of laws that together defined the essential character of slavery and race relations in Virginia. The typical black woman could be bought, sold, or mortgaged. Though she could not marry, she was encouraged to bear children who could be taken away from her at any time. She could protest, 
but her owner could legally beat her to death. Producing cloth and nursing became ways for slave women to get out of the fields. They became skilled and valued laborers while improving their positions. From the 1700s to the 1800s, women all over Virginia took up the manufacture of linen and wool, which was both exported and used to make their families' clothing. The new industry also became an outlet for creative energy. Needlework and quilting were expressions of culture and sources of pride on the domestic front. As we see in these quilts from the late 1800s, quilting surpassed its function as a home-produced essential to become recognized as art. Because you're one of mine, and you were the weaver's bonnie. What is lighter than the mill? Social conventions became more concrete and women settled back into what, according to English common law, were their proper roles. Under the law, single women and widows had the same rights and obligations as men. Upon marrying, however, a woman entered a state called civil death. She surrendered everything to her husband, who had absolute control over her earnings, her property, and her children. Her husband could legally beat her, and under the law, she could not write a will or take a case to court. Free white women then saw the opportunities of their pioneering grandmothers disappear. Women were confined to the home. Their lives revolved around their husbands. Fashions reflected their circumstances of confinement in corsets and tight lacing a fashion that continued to the late 1800s. Single women in the 1700s found it difficult to manage property and make a living. Some needed welfare. Exceptions to this somber picture were women business owners, many of them widows, like Mary Willing Bird. Traditional businesses for women included millinery, baking, and sewing. For most women, starting or taking over a business was a fight for survival and self-sufficiency. Like women entrepreneurs of the 1800s and 1900s, colonial women broke new ground by heading up non-traditional businesses such as newspaper publishing, stone cutting, and milling. Many women made their livings as inn and tavern keepers, like Williamsburg's Christiana Campbell. Oh, so then you've heard of my fine reputation, have you, sir? Indeed, the widow Campbell is known throughout the city of Williamsburg, and I might add, advertised in the Virginia Gazette as having none but the most genteel accommodations for gentlemen such as yourself, sir. Indeed, I'm justly proud of that reputation, having managed on my own since the death of my husband Ebenezer some years ago. Rest assured, sir, I'll not be following the lead of many widows here about the city who've remarried. No, indeed, if I should do so, then I'd have a husband to tell me how to manage my affairs. Now, I'll have none of that, I can tell you. Oh, sir, uh, as to the matter of your bill, uh, I do trust that you'll follow Colonel Washington's example and, uh, Settle your sum upon taking your leave most promptly. Well, we women of business must be about ours. Good day, sir. Well, I went into business because it was actually a dream of my husband's first and then myself. But he was more convincing than I was. And he came with the idea that I would be ideally suited for a restaurant. And I was not over enthusiastic about it. But once I became convinced, I became like the convert and pushed on. My goal was always to treat each person that comes into the restaurant as very special. We're small, so I'm not interested in feeding hundreds or thousands of people, but I want to relate to each person as best I can and provide a fine dining experience. When I first started in my professional life and accomplished anything that was outstanding, 
the highest compliment that my colleagues could give me was, Jacqueline, that's great. You think just like a man. Today, that would be considered an insult, and I'm very happy <laughs> about that. Uh, the greatest changes have been that women are now taken seriously in any and every aspect of life. Uh, we still sometimes have to be twice as good for half the salary, but that's also changing. Women have to prepare and do have to do a good job. I think not being afraid to fail is probably the most important quality you need to have, both in anything that you do. We were a tiny, tiny company, made um, $73,000 in sales our first year, and we were only able to buy fabric over the counter from a fabric man um, in Alexandria. And then we needed to find a resource for clothing and buttons going to the markets in New York City, and the, the disdain that I was treated with when I would come in and try to shop for fabric when I was interested in buying 25 or 100 yards at a time versus the thousands and thousands of yards that we buy now. And uh, then going into one place and asking for buttons and trotting in with my little leather briefcase and saying I'm here to buy buttons. And it was this, this very, very typical New York garment, garmento as we call him in here, who was greeting me at the door and um, asked me what I was looking for, told him I wanted to do business with his company, buy buttons, told him how many, and he pointed me to Woolworths. I feel that I also can be a role model for younger women who have get the opportunity to see a person in business who does not fit a lot of stereotypes that I think people tend to have about women in business. The women who came up a generation before me and are in business had a lot more difficult time and they, I think they got a bad rap because I think women had to be very, very aggressive and very, very domineering and very, in some cases, brassy in order to survive. It's quite a bit easier now, and I also think we're seeing more types of women, and I feel like I can be a role model for people to see that a woman in business can also be a human being and warm and caring and also a boss. You know, I've never been much of a cause person. Down deep, I've always thought that women had a personal integrity and, and an awareness of their own value that couldn't be bestowed on them by men or by anyone else. Then sometimes you just have to get out there in the marketplace. In the world that I shall always see as a man's world. And make them meet you on your own terms. But I think women's attitudes have changed. Women can do anything. I guess you have to find your own sense of worth and that's something you want to pass on to your children and to your grandchildren. In 1776, the colonies went to war for independence. Without an elaborate quartermaster system, the army needed women to do women's work. Sarah Benjamin's husband demanded that she come along. She said it would not do for the men to fight and starve too. For three years, she washed and mended clothes and cooked for the soldiers. Her work was never done. Even as the soldiers celebrated the end of the war at Yorktown, Sarah Benjamin prepared the morning breakfast. Will we ever know the full extent of women's work during the Revolution? Every school child knows that George Washington was at Valley Forge, but how many know that Martha Washington was there with him? We can only guess what women felt about a new country based on the claim that all men are created equal. We know of one woman, Hannah Lee Corbin, who tried to apply the revolutionary ideals. By claiming taxation without representation, she appealed to her brother, Richard Henry Lee, in the Continental Congress for the vote for women. In the course of the war, hundreds of Virginia slaves took the risk of deserting their rebel owners for the freedom the British promised. For the first time, a large proportion of runaways were women. The change in attitudes after the war encouraged a law passed in 1782, making it possible for blacks to be freed. By the turn of the century, there were rapidly growing communities of free persons of color. In these communities, women were prominent from the beginning. By 1810, there were 2,000 free blacks in Richmond and Petersburg alone. 
tide turned in 1831 when white response to Nat Turner's rebellion forced many blacks to leave the state. Incredibly, those who stayed made steady progress in acquiring land. In Petersburg, 45% of free black landowners were women, while white women controlled only 25% of white-owned land. Young children were often freed along with their mothers. Most free black women, therefore, supported children. Because free black women outnumbered free black men three to two, the typical woman could not count on having a husband to help her out. Moreover, many free black women chose not to marry. Women so recently free did not give up their legal autonomy lightly. Testimonies of former owners were important for most free black women, like Rainey Davis, to find work or start businesses of their own. Amelia Gallet opened a bathhouse. Mary Savoy became a grocer. Fortune Thomas of Halifax was a confectioner. Most jobs available to black women paid very little. While a number of skilled crafts were open to black men, women were left with domestic work, laundering, sewing, midwifing, or stemming tobacco. The ability to support themselves and their families gave these women a strong sense of self-sufficiency and pride. These values are still strongly held by working women today. I went to work for the bakery when I was 16. I started out washing pans and uh, cleaning the front, the sales room. And then after that, I learned to come back in the kitchen to learn how to make cakes. I never had no help from the welfare or nothing. All I ever had was what I worked for. Everything that <clears throat> I have put in this house, I have scrambled and paid for it. I can say I don't owe nobody a dime for nothing in there. My grandmother at age 12 was married and uh, had to take care of seven children that were her stepchildren. And uh, four of those children were older than she. Um, and taking care of those children, she had to grow up very, very quickly. Um, she bore to my great-grandfather nine children. And uh, just to see that family interact uh, as a kid, um, the strength was there. And um, she was the matriarch mother or grandmother to all of us. With me in design work, I did not have a model. Um, much of um, the problems I've encountered were not examples in a textbook. Uh, the theory wasn't even there. I found that the laws at that time were not favorable for women um, to receive credit on their own recognition. Um, I found that um, all credit lines that I had were basically in my husband's name. At that time, uh, I was going through a divorce and um, found that I must do what I could to develop funds for um, my own business. So um, we've gone through the divorce and property settlement, and I mortgaged my home. And with $5,000, I started my business. I find it very difficult, uh, a single woman uh, rearing two kids, um, especially when they see the very hard side of me that must interact in business. And the woman, uh, the woman who comes home after a hard day, after jumping those hurdles with, with tears and uh, aching limbs and not having someone to deal with that particular time to help me get over this. Though some white women ventured into jobs, they remained in the minority, for the overriding emphasis of the 19th century was the cult of the home. In the early 1800s, motherhood was transformed into a nation-saving mission. For the first time in centuries, women were told they were more virtuous than men and less beset by animal passions.
white women gradually began to use the cult of the home to gain entry into other spheres. As much as Virginia women wanted the right to an education, the argument that won their case was for their sons. To best train their sons, women argued, they must be educated themselves. After 1800, schools for young women spread across the state. By the 1850s, a number of schools were calling themselves colleges. Women expanded their roles as guardians of virtue by forming religious societies to aid the poor, the vast majority of whom were women and children. Excluded from what men defined as the world, women, through the churches, created a public world of their own. The North and South went to war in April, 1861. Because women were already organized through the churches, they now formed a great force. For the first time, their efforts were well recognized. They produced uniforms, tents, bedding, and bandages. In a six-month period, mothers and daughters in families like that of Marinda Cochran made 81 large overcoats, 53 jackets, 38 pair of drawers, and six pair of pants. Through a Confederate States Amendment, the government began paying its seamstresses, paying badly, but paying. And for the first time, women were hired to work in offices, performing a variety of clerical tasks, including copying government documents in longhand. Government support also went to hospital administrators like Sally Louisa Tompkins. She was the first American woman to be commissioned a military officer. Captain Sally accepted the rank, refused the pay, and with her staff lost only 73 of 1,333 patients. By 1863, the war's astonishing inflation rate left most Virginians hungry and starving. Led by Mary Jackson, over 2,000 women assembled in Capitol Square intent on demanding that merchants sell them goods at government prices. Rioting erupted, and the women smashed windows and doors, making off with flour, bacon, shoes, brooms, and whatever else was to be found. For thousands of Civil War orphans and widows, the next 20 years were bleak in the face of extreme poverty. Virginia was a land without resources, drained economically and emotionally. Relationships between whites and former slaves were often confused and bitter. Not knowing which way to turn, most ex-slaves left their former owners to make the barest of livings. Progress in education perhaps best symbolizes the positive aspects of the period. In the new Constitution of 1870, Virginia at last provided for a public elementary school system. In this racially segregated system, young black teachers like Lucy Sims saw themselves as missionaries. Beyond the elementary schools, there were private industrial or normal institutes for blacks, among them Hartshorn Memorial College, now Virginia Union University, Hampton Institute, the most famous of these, and Stanton Normal Institute. Half of the schools were founded by black leaders like Jenny Dean, who opened the Manassas Industrial School for the training of colored youth. With the increased demand for black teachers, the General Assembly in 1882 established the first fully state-supported black college in the country, the Virginia Normal and Collegiate Institute. Many Virginia women, black and white, went as far as they could in their educations. Oriana Russell Moon and Rebecca Lee, however, had to leave the state to become doctors. In his book, Woman's Place in the Christian World, Dr. W. W. Parker wrote in 1892, to allow women to practice medicine or law aims at the complete destruction of society, subversion of religion, and reign of chaos. 
uh, it was always understood in my home that I would do something. And I used to say I wanted to be a doctor and a mother. And people used to laugh when I said I wanted to be a mother. So I stopped saying I wanted to be a mother and just said I wanted to be a doctor. I went to uh, Virginia Union University for college, uh, which was at home. It's in Richmond. Uh, when I went to medical school, it was Meharry uh, Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. At that time, it was unique and that it was all black. I had no problems with uh, race. However, there was a problem with minority group of women. Uh, many of the professors did not want females in school, and they told us so, so in class. They would say that you're here to get a husband, you're not going to practice, or you're only taking up a spot where a man could uh, fill in who would be doing something with it. But whenever a teenager comes into my office, I always ask them, what do you want to be? I realize that it's a short period of time when I'm going to see them. But if I keep asking them, what do you want to be, at least it will start them to thinking. In 1892, women were allowed to practice medicine but they were banished from practicing law. Virginia was also the last state to grant married women the right to own property in their own names. The U.S. Census of 1900 shows that a full three quarters of Virginia's women workers had jobs at the bottom of the occupational ladder as domestic servants, waitresses, agricultural laborers, factory hands, and seamstresses. By 1980, the situation was unchanged. The gap between the average earnings of men and women actually widened after 1960. I started uh, 1967 uh, at uh, Jedward Ferguson Seafood at Remlick. Because at that time, that's all I thought I could do. Because uh, I didn't graduate from high school and I didn't have a diploma. And I didn't want to do high school, so I started shucking oysters. Let's see, at 44, I went back to school. I got my GED, and then in the next, and the next year, I completed my nurse's training job, and then I got a full-time job. Nurses aid training, and that's good because I've been having problems, you know. And I just figured, well, I thought I needed to depend on somebody else to take care of me. And by getting out and doing this, I proved that I can take care of myself. Because I have my full-time job and I can, and my part-time job. So if it have to be, I can. The gradual swing from farming to factory in the 1900s brought a radical shift. Women, once producers of food, clothing, and basic goods, now became consumers. In the 1700s, a household was called the Little Commonwealth, the center of private industry. In the 20th century, however, women found that self-managed work in the home was replaced by closely supervised, rigidly structured work in the office or factory. Until the 1960s, society still dictated that married white women stay in the home. A few labor-saving devices, like the pedal sewing machine, were invented before 1900. Major electrical appliances did not come about for another 20 to 50 years. To make money, thousands of Virginia housewives took in sewing or washing, looked after boarders or lodgers, sold wine or corn liquor, or sent milk, eggs, or garden produce to the market. From 1900 to 1930, women poured their energy into the greatest progressive movement to date. The work they did challenged the traditional role of women furthered the building of a better society, and achieved nothing less than an organizational revolution in Virginia. Among the first of the causes taken up by Virginia women was the preservation of historic sites. Members of the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities, the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Virginia Society of Colonial Dames, and hundreds of garden clubs saved countless historic documents, buildings, and sites. Through their efforts, historic sites became a focal point of what is now a $3.7 billion tourism industry.
In the field of social action, the Industrial Home School for Colored Girls was a model institution. Supported by the Virginia Federation of Colored Women's Clubs and led by Janie Porter Barrett, the school was widely imitated. A national movement with over 50 homes for unwed mothers across the country was headed by Kate Waller Barrett. When she died in 1925, the flag over the state capitol flew at half-mast. She was believed to be the first woman so honored. Women organized to help the disadvantaged on still another front, public health. Women's groups established hospitals for the poor. Through organizations such as the Instructive Visiting Nurses Association, they also pioneered care of poor patients outside of hospitals. A key figure in organizing women's efforts was Lila Mead Valentine. With her friend Mary Munford, she led the educational reform movement in Virginia. At the turn of the century, they helped to establish compulsory attendance. In the system, only 30% of the eligible pupils actually appeared. After the General Assembly vetoed the establishment of a degree-granting college for women at the University of Virginia, women became convinced they needed the power of the vote. In 1909, a small group formed the Equal Suffrage League, electing Lila Mead Valentine as their president. Suffrage had an economic motive. With the vote, women could support laws for better labor conditions, education, medical care, and assistance for the underprivileged. Lobbying campaigns from 1912 to 1916 failed to convince the Virginia legislature. The General Assembly finally surrendered to the inevitability of the federal law enacted in 1920. In the same year, legislators expanded the poll tax and literacy requirements to ensure no increase in the vote from black women. While Virginia women made no headway with suffrage, they did find tremendous success in business and the arts. Virginia's outstanding businesswoman was Maggie Lena Walker. At age 32, Walker became the head of the Order of St. Luke, a black fraternal society. In the space of 25 years, the order grew from 57 local chapters to 1,500. In 1903, Walker founded the St. Luke Penny Savings Bank, which later became Consolidated Bank and Trust Company. She is believed to be the first woman bank president in the United States. In the arts, Mary Johnston became a household name in 1900 when she published To Have and to Hold. The book topped the bestseller list. In 1913, with Hagar, she turned to feminist fiction, and so did her friend, Alan Glasgow. With the appearance of her book, Virginia, Glasgow emerged as a leading American novelist. Undine Moore, a composer and educator of national reputation, was recently honored by the State Department of Education. In cooperation with the Virginia Women's Cultural History Project, Undine S. Moore, composer, music educator, and scholar, 1984. She taught at Virginia State University in a career spanning 45 years. Her scenes from the life of a martyr was presented at Carnegie Hall. In an era unequal to date, Virginia women in the early 20th century compiled a stunning record of public service. Women who succeeded in business, the arts, or the professions devoted themselves in a significant way to reform or community service. They persisted in asking society to value children, motherhood, health, and education. It was, as Mary Johnston said, the mother sentiment in politics. Women may be clear about the values they feel are important, but realizing their contributions to the economy for unpaid work is something else. I believe that one thing my generation has learned from the younger generation is that you can take charge of your life and you can make changes. And I think that w some women are the first ones not to understand that women and men have many different choices to make. And I remember in the old days when I was still doing volunteer work and working part-time, if someone called me in the morning,
to, let's say, work at the thrift shop because they were uh, shorthanded that morning, and I would say, I'm sorry, I'm tied up with my children, they would say, oh, you can get someone to t take care of the children. That's no excuse. We need you this morning. But the first time that I said, I'm sorry, I have to be at the office, the woman at the other end of the phone said, oh, of course, I'm sorry I even called and uh, disturbed you. That is, she did not herself understand that when she or I chose to be with their children, that was equally important as when she or I choose to be at the office. Of course, there are many more notable Virginia women to be recognized. Many of these uncommon achievers have been well documented for their involvement in Virginia life from World War I through the Civil Rights era to the present. Throughout Virginia's history, women have had a profound effect on their families, their communities, and the nation. For centuries, our views have been shaped by historians who felt women were unlikely to be historically significant. Yet we've seen that women share a common bond that has held our families and society together. Values of compassion, cooperation, service, and nurturance. Douglas Southall Freeman wrote that if we knew more about the history of women, our society would be more understandable. Part of that understanding must come from reassessing the work of women. And women must reassess how they value themselves. In building a world for men and women, this may be a good place to begin. <laughs>